But here, we have something completely different. We've got a spruce forest here, underneath the salt marsh. We can dig out here the bark, the bark of Sitka spruce. These trees can only grow on dry land. Yet this layer of trees was covered with mud that must have been deposited by water. So the land here must once have been higher. And then, at some point, it dropped down, plunging the forest underwater. At the time that the spruce forest dropped down, sand was laid down. It's the first thing that covers the, the peat is a little skin of sand. So that's the mystery. How did that happen? Since there's no sand nearby, there must have been a sudden rush of seawater that carried the sand in with it. This was no gradual change in land level. It must have been a violent collapse. The easiest explanation for that is that you had an earthquake that caused the land here to drop and also warped the seafloor. That, that warping of the seafloor set off a tsunami and the tsunami then lays down the sand on the freshly downdropped land surface. Carbon dating of the buried trees showed that this event had occurred roughly 300 years ago, before Europeans had arrived. So the native legends might indeed be about a real event. But it would need more than just layers of mud to prove that there had been a devastating earthquake here. The next piece of evidence was to come from thousands of miles away. As the Indonesia earthquake has shown, megathrust earthquakes cause damage at astonishing distances because they create tsunamis. If such an earthquake really had occurred in Cascadia, it should have created a tsunami capable of traveling right across the Pacific to countries like Japan. Kenji Sataki is a geologist who studies earthquakes and tsunamis. When Sataki heard about Brian Atwater's theory, he realized Japan could hold the answer. 300 years ago is prehistoric time for Americans, but in Japan we have uh, documents that would record the tsunami from, uh, Amer uh, from Cascadia 300 years ago. So that's why we started looking for the records. What Satake was looking for was a very special kind of tsunami. Most tsunamis in Japan are caused by nearby earthquakes, so they're accompanied by shaking of the ground. But a few tsunamis arrive without shaking, because the parent earthquake is far away. When there's no known earthquake that could have caused the wave, it's called an orphan tsunami. So Sataki started hunting for records of an orphan tsunami that could have come from the Pacific Northwest. And in the coastal town of Miho, southwest of Tokyo, there's a document that describes just such a tsunami. On this page, uh, it describes the tsunami of uh, January 28th, of 1700. On that day, from morning, the tsunami arrived this town, um, like a high tide, and it, the receding wave was like a big river, and it continued like seven times until the noon of the day. The account told how the villagers took refuge in a shrine that still exists today. 
The author also recorded that this tsunami was unlike any that he had experienced before. Writer note that there was no earthquake, but the tsunami arrived, so he was surprised. And he said such a uh, strange thing should be uh, passed to the uh, future generation. Crucially, the same tsunami was recorded in four other accounts from different parts of Japan. So this couldn't be a local event. Sataki thought this tsunami might indeed have come from a huge megathrust earthquake 5,000 miles away in Cascadia. But still there was no proof that the tsunami had come from North America. The carbon dating only showed that the Cascadia event had happened at roughly the same time as the orphan tsunami. The final piece of evidence would be found in a mysterious corner of the Pacific Northwest. A hundred miles southwest of Seattle, in a remote area of the Washington coast, is the ghost forest. These are trees that died hundreds of years ago, but remain standing to this day. Sometime in the past, this would have been an intact red cedar forest. Um, large trees standing 100 feet or more in the air. And this landscape was filled with them. And then one day, something killed the trees here in place. And the mystery is, what killed them? You know, what could kill an entire forest along 60 miles of, of Washington coast? Um, just like this. Tree specialist David Yamaguchi has spent years trying to solve the mystery of what happened to the trees. He wanted to work out when they had died by looking at their tree rings. Most people know that trees have annual rings. So depending on the climate from year to year, the um, tree, tree rings are either wide or narrow, or wide or narrow. And so they're developing a barcode um, going back in time that's unique in time. Using this pattern, David was able to work out exactly when the trees had died. And he found out that all of them had died around the early months of 1700. The summer before uh, the, the tsunami hit Japan, these trees were just growing happily in the forest here. Then the winter came along, and by the following summer, they were all dead. And so the tree ring story matched the Japanese tsunami records perfectly. There was now no doubt that the same catastrophe that had killed the ghost forest had also sent the tsunami across to Japan. And from the Japanese records, Kenji Satake could work out exactly when it had happened. On the 26th of January, 1700, at 9 p.m. On that winter's night, a megathrust earthquake, just like the Boxing Day earthquake of 2004, struck the Pacific Northwest. It drowned forests and turned land into sea. It sent a tsunami hurtling across the Pacific. And it spawned a legend that would be passed down through a dozen generations. The scientists knew that if it had happened here once, it would happen again. One day, the people of the Pacific Northwest will face a megathrust earthquake. So how big will it be? What damage will it cause? And when will it happen?